Hey everybody, Rob Maurer here, and today we've got another pretty negative day for Tesla stock on very high volume, so we'll talk a bit about that. We've also got production numbers for Tesla in China, some news on Tesla in Germany, updates on the EV tax credits in the United States, Rivian earnings, and more. All right, so the difficulty for Tesla stock continues down another 7.2% today to close at $177.59, Tesla now trading at just 55 times, trailing 12-month gap earnings. The Nasdaq was down 2.5% on the day today, so significant underperformance from Tesla. And Tesla actually this morning was a little bit green and overperforming before a pretty sharp drop off this afternoon. Looking at volume, this was the second highest volume day for Tesla since mid-July, second only to yesterday's 128 million shares. We're at about 124 million today, that's before the after hours volume, but very close. And again, given the overperformance in the morning, it doesn't seem like an immediate reaction to any of the news that we had yesterday about Elon and his Form 4s being filed. So extremely high volume and underperformance starting intraday. That would certainly seem to have the characteristics of a large seller entering the market, perhaps Elon. Now, over the last month or two, we have had high volume days where people have been pretty convinced that Elon was selling and turned out to not be the case. That's a possibility. It is also possible that someone is trying to make it look like Elon is selling and then take advantage of that reaction, just dump a bunch of short shares into the market, create a big red candle, and then capitalize on the continued downtrend. I think that specific scenario is less likely than Elon actually having sold today, but stuff like that does happen. And one of the advantages that institutions have specifically is that they can see the order books, they can see how leveraged certain positions are, and then take advantage of those leveraged positions and push stocks down to force selling or force capitulation and then buy back shares that they shorted at a lower price or scoop up shares at a discount to hold long. And the options market only exacerbates this kind of activity. And we know Tesla is a huge, huge percentage of the options market. So regardless of what today actually ends up being, those kind of things are still important to keep in mind, especially as we are likely moving through a period here where some of that forced capitulation is happening. And hopefully that's nobody here, but stuff like that in the right macro environment, which in this case means a terrible macro environment, those are the type of things that lead to stocks just hitting values that seem completely unreasonable for short periods of time. So anyway, getting back to whether or not it's Elon, he really shouldn't have much more that he needs to sell for the Twitter acquisition. We've walked through the math on that a number of times. We'll do it one more time here just for completeness sake. So the total commitment originally was $46.5 billion. Elon has already raised $19.3 billion before any of these sales. Then there was $13 billion in debt. That's all locked in. There shouldn't be any changes on that. If there were, that would completely change the equity structure of the acquisition. It would be similar to raising capital to pay off debt for a public company. So shouldn't be anything with that. That gets us to 32.3 billion of the 46 and a half. So at that point, 14.2 billion left. Half of that was committed from other equity investors. So then there was maybe 7.1 billion remaining to cover the initial commitment. As we talked about though, Twitter's share count had been reduced. Not sure exactly what caused that. So that's what left us with maybe four and a half billion remaining. So because we aren't sure with the share count thing, let's say somewhere between four and a half billion to seven billion was remaining. We have since learned that Jack Dorsey did opt to roll over his 18 million shares of Twitter, so that's about a billion dollars. The Saudi prince with 35 million shares did the same, so that's another 1.9 billion, so about 2.9 billion in total from those two. So that brings the range of need that we just talked about down to 1.6 billion to 4.2 billion remaining. That of course does not include the 3.95 billion that Elon sold from Friday. So the math there shows that as of yesterday, it should be pretty much taken care of, but we are left with two uncertainties. The first uncertainty is that we don't know how much tax Elon is paying on these sales. I have assumed zero because Elon has shares that he exercised last year that would have a high cost basis. He can be selling those and be generating capital losses when raising these funds. That would seem like the logical choice, but Elon has surprised us a little bit on those choices in the past. Nevertheless, all of this has assumed no money set aside from these sales for taxes. Now, the other uncertainty, that group of other investors for $7.1 billion, we don't know how much of that ended up coming through. I would have assumed that if it were not a significant portion of that, Elon would have been selling more sooner, but maybe he didn't because of the blackout period and things like that. So it could be that whatever is the remaining amount of that commitment is what Elon would still have to sell after the sales that we had learned about yesterday. If all of those commitments did get fulfilled, then barring any weirdness with taxes, Elon should have been done yesterday. So that's the clearest picture of the math that we've got today, somewhere between $0 remaining and $7 billion remaining, assuming Elon minimized taxes with the combination of these sales. And remember, in that worst case, that $7 billion case, that assumes no other equity investors came through. You've got Larry Ellison on there for a billion. You've got other investors that Elon has worked with in the past that presumably want to honor their commitments. 
So pretty much a certainty that at least some of that came through. So I hope walking through the math on that helps people with their understanding. We'll know for sure whether or not Elon sold today by Friday. Remember, Form 4s have to be filed within two business days of the transactions. All right, let's move on to Tesla in China because I did get the October production numbers from the CPCA. Reuters has already reported on this today as well. But Tesla's production at Giga Shanghai in October was a record 87,706 vehicles. I am very happy with this number, especially after the wholesale sales figure that we had talked about previously and how big of a spread we might see between production and wholesale sales. Here we're seeing 16,000 more vehicles produced than that wholesale sales number. So of course, Reuters reporting this as a big growth in inventory, but as we have talked about before, this is the norm for the first month of a quarter. On every single occasion we have seen Tesla in the first month outproduce to the wholesale sales figure. So that overproduction or build in inventory is represented in pink in this chart. And if we just isolate in on that overproduction, we can see that that has grown pretty steadily over time. We are seeing a bit of a bigger jump here in October than what a trend line might have indicated, but that trend line is thrown off a bit because of the weird production shutdowns with COVID and production upgrades that we had in the first months of Q2 and Q3. So anyway, if we look back at production, that total is about 5,600 more vehicles than Tesla produced in September. We're seeing a split here of 32,254 Model 3, 55,452 Model Y. On a weekly basis combined, this ends up being 19,800 per week. That's about 96.5% of the 20,500 vehicles per week that has been reported as Tesla's targeted production rate post upgrade. That split was reported to be 13,000 Model Y and 7,500 Model 3. So as a percent of those targets by vehicle, Model Y at 96.3%, Model 3 at 97.0%, which is an important figure because that shows us that both vehicles on their own are pretty much at their targeted production rates. Remember, we should have a little bit of a reduced production number here in October because of the holiday early in the month. Tesla worked through it, but some people probably took that off. So the mix between the two was a little bit odd in September, but this being back to normal kind of confirms those targets and also confirms that things are now smooth going as planned which is excellent, excellent news for the fourth quarter. I was a little bit worried that maybe we'd get something like an 82, 83,000 vehicle number, which would still leave us with questions on that Shanghai ramp. Well, those questions here are very thoroughly answered. It's ramped. If this even just extrapolates through November and December, which hopefully it improves a bit because remember we did have that holiday at the beginning of the month. If this just evenly extrapolates, that would suggest over 260,000 vehicles from Shanghai in Q4. Now that also is of course dependent upon downtime. As far as I know, there is none scheduled, but there certainly could be within one of those two months. The other really exciting thing about this production number, 87,000 vehicles per month, that extrapolates to more than 1 million vehicles per year. I don't think people fully appreciate this. Tesla has achieved this at Giga Shanghai in less than three years from first production. It truly is insane, so huge congratulations to the Tesla China team for that milestone. So I'm very happy with this production number and what it means for the rest of Q4. That said, I do want to briefly revisit the conversation from yesterday about domestic demand in China and just hopefully explain that a little bit better. The first thing would just be that I would hope that whenever I have conversations like that, people are bringing in context from other episodes. So even though I'm talking about demand concerns in China, I still think production is the most important number for Tesla. And I'm still just as bullish on the company. I haven't sold any stock or anything like that. I don't have any plans to. It's just a red flag and that red flag should be lowering shorter term expectations on the margin line, I think. That's all I'm trying to express. Obviously, when we saw Tesla drop prices in China, everybody should have gone back and unless they already suspected that that was coming, revised their margin expectations for Q4. You just have to. Like I'm already modeling in the cost of goods sold benefits that I think Tesla is going to achieve. And I think those are way more significant than what people are expecting right now. That's a huge part of what makes me more bullish on Tesla than the average analyst. But when we see signs of demand softness, that needs to be factored in too. So does that change my bull thesis on Tesla? No. It just changes my expectations a bit for average selling prices, for margins, both gross margin and operating margins, and ultimately net income for more of the short and medium length type of time periods. So those are the type of impacts that softer demand signs have, and we're going to already see that show up in the financials here in Q4 because of the price cuts that we've already seen in China. But whatever, that's not a big deal so much on its own. Where the concern really accelerates is that right now, going back to our multiple conversations on demand pockets, Tesla China should not be in a demand pocket right now or a valley. It should be peaking. Tesla just lowered prices by 5% pretty much across the board in effect to a consumer on the Model Y standard range. It's more like a 10% cut. Plus people were already holding off, delaying their order, waiting for this to happen. 
So when it finally does, you should see a massive influx from those people plus huge demand for new orders with that new price cut. Furthering that point here in Q4, we should be seeing even more of a desire to order before the end of the year because that new energy vehicle tax credit in China expires at the end of the year. So there should be a spike in orders. That should be clear. We should be in that spike right now. And yet Tesla is already layering on another demand incentive, which if they had a strong amount of orders, there wouldn't really be any reason to do. The added concern then is what happens once we move out of this period of time where we should be seeing orders spike. Now they've already pulled the second demand lever. What happens when things normalize and we don't have the simultaneous boost of a fresh price cut with held orders flowing in and orders pulled forward because of that new energy vehicle credit expiration? On the other side of those things lies a possible valley, and then you've got Tesla dramatically increasing production. That's where price and margin concerns come in. Now, yes, Tesla can export those, but then we've got Giga Berlin ramping up, and we should be working through the backlog in Europe and other places. The concern, not necessarily as much from me, but the concern in the marketplace is going to be okay, what happens then? Does Tesla have to do the same thing in Europe that we just saw them do in China? We've already seen them introduce the Model Y standard range in Europe, which is a move in this direction that we haven't seen them really do in the US yet. So we'll pause there and I already feel people yelling at me, that's the point of Tesla, that's what they're trying to do, bring costs down. Absolutely, yes, that is the point. The question is how sudden does that have to be to keep up with Tesla's production and what the margin rate is at those levels. For example, I don't think this is gonna happen, but just for example, I don't think there's any Tesla bulls out there modeling for a 15% gross margin for next year. Those are the kinds of questions that start to percolate when we see things like this. Again, not necessarily for me, but those questions enter the market institutional investors become nervous. You can't shake it out of them. Demand is always going to be their main question when Tesla is growing at these rates. Like I said yesterday, I think that the progress that Tesla will end up making on reducing their cost of goods sold is under forecasted, underappreciated by the broader market right now. That's why these kinds of things don't really change my demand thesis, but those are things I was already forecasting for. So if demand is coming in a little bit softer than maybe I expected, my average selling prices, my margins, my earnings per share, all that has to come down a little bit. Also, as I alluded to yesterday, this isn't necessarily even a reflection on Tesla. It could just be a reflection on the market in China right now, but that's kind of the point too. What happens if we see that same thing in Europe? There would be plenty of reasons for that. Those are the concerns, even setting aside all the stuff with Elon, that I think the market has regarding Tesla right now. So I know we spent a lot of time on that. I hope that clarifies some of my thoughts from yesterday. It's always difficult to get these points across on a live stream. It's hard enough with the benefit of editing. I'm still going to have people that are misunderstanding this and thinking I'm some bear on Tesla now. It's not the case, but we should all be keeping our eyes very open and very aware of possible red flags like I believe this is. I mean, why would Tesla add an incentive if they were happy with where the order book was at? Now, the other thing to add to this that may be a little bit more of a positive reflection on it, I haven't 100% confirmed this, but I do believe that that insurance credit is only on inventory vehicles. So it might seem like, oh, well, why does it even matter then if it's only inventory? Well, Tesla's probably not going to have much inventory or produce much inventory if they're happy with that order book. So I don't really think it changes too much the conversation. Tesla's not really producing to order anyway. So what really constitutes an inventory vehicle? It's not entirely clear. I've heard anecdotally that orders that aren't just being picked up off the inventory lot same day or anything like that are still receiving this bonus. So my assumption would be that this would be applied to most sales. That may be wrong, but I'm not waiting that inventory clause as heavily as some others might be. Last comment on this is that, as I said before, I view this as more of a short to medium term type of thing. I think it's more a reflection on the economy than on Tesla. As that turns around, I don't expect this to be so much of the case. And if that is correct, that should be a much bigger concern for any Tesla competitors than it is for Tesla because Tesla's got the margin to give, other people don't. So we'll move on. Just want to reiterate, still bullish on Tesla just because we're discussing something that maybe is a little bit more bearish doesn't mean that changes my whole thesis or anything like that. I shouldn't have to review that every time we discuss something that's not maybe super positive. Yet it seems if I don't do that, people interpret my natural subdued <laughs> emotions on live streams as uh, some sort of depression. So that's cool, but <laughs> it's inaccurate. As I've said before, I'm just not a super emotive person. So I guess keep that in mind. I think people just project whatever the stock price is doing onto me and assume that that is <laughs> my accompanying emotion. Not the case. All right. Well, we still do have a few other topics here. First, some news on the electric vehicle tax credit hat tip to Tesserati for noticing this. There has been a bill introduced by Democrats in the House that would change the structure of the EV tax credit. We've talked a lot about the pushback that the U.S. has received internationally for this portion of the Inflation Reduction Act. This bill seems to seek to resolve some of those complaints. So we'll dig out our old marked up version of how this has evolved over time. Basically, the black is how it started. The green is what has been added through the IRA. 
and then the orange are the proposals from this bill. So here we see that to qualify as a new clean vehicle, the stipulation that requires final assembly occurring in North America is altered with the preface of in the case of any motor vehicle sold after December 31st, 2025. So basically just pushing that requirement back by three years from day one of the act, January 1st, 2023 to January 1st, 2026 instead. Said another way, you would be eligible for the credits for vehicles with final assembly outside of North America for the first three years. Next change is within excluded entities. Previously, this put a restriction on earning the credits if the vehicle's battery contained any critical minerals that were extracted, processed, or recycled by a foreign entity of concern for any vehicle placed in service after year-end 2024, or the same foreign entity of concern stipulation for battery components after year-end 2023. Both of those under this bill would be pushed back one year. Next would be changes on the critical mineral and battery component requirements themselves. Remember this scales up over time, the percentage that is required to be eligible for these credits, which each earn half the $7,500 credit. For critical minerals, it basically scraps the applicable percentage, which was 40% for any vehicle before January 1st, 2024, and replaces that whole line just to say, in the case of a vehicle placed in service during calendar year 2026, 40%. So it removes the before part, that leaves no language to let us know what the percentage would be before 2026, so I assume it would have to be then 0%. All the dates then as it scales up are pushed back three years. Same exact thing for battery components, it says during calendar year 2026, and then it pushes all those dates back, although they were different, by three years. So I assume that that means anything before 2026 has no requirement, in which case it doesn't matter where your components or your minerals come from for those first three years. And again, they also delayed the final assembly having to happen in North America as well. So I'd have to read through the entirety of this again, because remember, it all builds on top of itself. So I have a low amount of certainty with this, but it seems like the intent of the bill is to basically just make all electric vehicles eligible for the full credit for three years. That would give everybody more time to react as those qualifications become more strict. Now, you would still have some of those foreign entity of concern things hitting before 2026, but... This would certainly seem to open up those credits, and you'd still have the income limits and things like that. And obviously, this is just a bill. We have no idea how far or how much support this will get, but it's the first attempted change that I have seen so far. So we'll have to return to keeping a very close eye on this, but if these changes went through, it would seem to follow that perhaps, again, have to read through everything, but perhaps Tesla could be importing vehicles from China to the United States that may be eligible for the full credit. Again, don't hold me to that, but it seems possible. When we think about Tesla's worldwide production, average selling prices in different regions, it all at the end of the day is related. Tesla's going to try to put that production where it makes the most profit, all things considered. All right, last few items here. We'll try to go pretty quick through these, but looks like Tesla's got another parts distribution warehouse happening in Germany. Thanks to Stecker Auto for tagging me on this one. So this is in southern Germany, a little bit west of Munich, and apparently a 23,500 square meter facility, so about 250,000 square feet. This comes after we have talked a couple of times in probably the last month or so about warehouses that have popped up in the United States. This one too seems to be for parts distribution, so it seems like Tesla is pretty aggressively expanding that capability in the recent months. Next, we've got an update from Foxconn. They have announced that they intend to build their first car next year called Project X, start mass production in 2024. They're going for some differentiation here. They say this will be a three-seat vehicle that costs less than $20,000. Earlier this week, Foxconn also announced taking a stake in Lordstown Motors. Next, we've got Rivian's Q3 earnings report. They did report a net loss of $1.7 billion on revenue of about $530 million. Revenue was a little bit short of analyst expectations. Apparently that loss was a decent amount lower than analyst expectations. Their operating expenses for the quarter still $857 million, so basically half of what Tesla's are. And remember, that's operating expenses, nothing to do with cost of goods sold. So still very high, but Rivian did say that they do have $14 billion of cash and cash equivalents on hand at the end of the quarter. They did reaffirm their 25,000 production guidance for the year like they had previously when production was announced, so we've already talked about that. They said that they've got 114,000 net pre-orders on their books as of November 7th versus 98,000 at the end of June, and they noted that they have started a second production shift. They also reaffirmed their annual guidance for EBITDA for the year, but they have lowered their capital expenditure forecast. They did provide an update on their next platform. They call that the R2 versus, of course, the R1 right now. They say that they expect that to launch in 2026. All right, last item for today, just a couple of quick updates on Twitter. First, the New York Times has reported that Twitter has registered paperwork with the U.S. Treasury Department to become a payment processor. 
So this, of course, would be a key piece of the X.com vision that Elon has talked about having for Twitter. He talked a lot more about that today in a Twitter Spaces event, alongside a lot of other things related to advertising on Twitter and the changes that they're working to make within the platform. In the interest of time, we won't go through all of those, but I did post my bullet point notes from listening to that on Twitter. So if you're interested in that, I'll put a link to that down in the description to that. All right, long one here, but that is where we'll wrap it up for today. So as always, thank you for listening. Make sure you're subscribed and signed up for notifications. Also find me on Twitter at Tesla Podcast. We'll see you tomorrow for the Thursday, November 10th episode of Tesla Daily. Thank you.